through this toggle. Users only receive plastic cutlery upon request. We've saved over a billion packs of plastic cutlery from entering the waste stream, and that's a 600% behavior shift. It's saved millions of dollars for restaurants. Hi everyone, uh, this is Nick Huzar with Steph TV. And as many of you know that uh, happen to watch uh, my podcast or listen to it, I've been on this personal quest just trying to understand my own existence, how I impact the planet. And I really get a lot of energy from you know interviewing really interesting thought leaders. And I'm excited to have Sheila Moravati with me today with Habits of, of Waste. And it's a really interesting organization that she started. Uh, and I think it's we'll, we'll dig, dig a little bit deeper today into some of the areas she's interested in and how... Um, she can most, uh, most thoughtfully make an impact there. So, uh, Sheila, thank you for being here today. And, uh, yeah, with that, would love to learn a bit more about your background and, you know, what got you into this organization. Yeah. Thank you, Nick, for having me. It's so exciting to be here and to talk to you and your audience. Um, for me, I never expected to be an environmentalist at all. I mean, it is something that I probably could never have predicted um, in a million years. But that said, I was really fascinated with human behavior. I had taken some really cool classes in um, UCLA about anthropology. And one of our practices was, one of our like projects was to go and analyze people eating breakfast. And I remember uh, just sitting there and observing people eating muffins. And I noticed that the men used to take the muffin to their lips and take a bite out of the top, while the women used to take a piece off the top and put it in their mouth. And I did my paper on this, and it seems like a sort of benign thing, right? But as I went through life after that experiment, I started to see things a little differently. I started to learn how to be an observer, kind of like an anthropological, you know, researcher uh, of life. And I, as I was present moments in like restaurants and watching with my kid getting free crayons and then seeing them go in the trash, like it just started to occur to me that like, this is not really sustainable. This is not really good for the planet. There's so many kids who need those crayons. So I started my first organization called Crayon Collection simply through observing these habits of waste and that's where the organization evolved into because I saw a lot of those type of behaviors and I think when we started to do the first plastic straw ban in the world that's when people said are you doing crayons or straws and I said, but it's all a habit of waste. And I realized we had moved past crayon collection, which still exists and it's doing its thing, but only on that crayon issue. And now we have a whole bunch of other things that I've observed over time. Yeah, I, I think that the crayon one is fascinating because when you told me about this, I know I felt that firsthand it, it, with little kids going to different places and they always give you those crayons and then you end up throwing them away. Or in our case, sometimes you have a bin at home, right? And, and it's just, you know, we're never going to use all these. Right. And, um, you, uh, what was some of the stats you were sharing in terms of some of the numbers? Uh, I think it's pretty impactful what you've already done. Yeah, after I started seeing our, just my own collection grow and become, you know, over 100 crayons within like a, a few weeks, um, it was probably two months and I had that many crayons. We were going out to eat quite a bit. Um, I started to just dig in and I found out that restaurants in America throw away over 150 million crayons. Now, these are made of paraffin wax, which is essentially plastic. They don't decompose. And they're just like showing our children and our society how to be a throwaway society. And the, the bottom line is like they don't belong in the trash. They have so much life left in them. And many times they're brand new. So as I decided to do something about it, I found a solution where I would ask restaurants to donate the crayons locally to schools that are considered Title I or Head Start centers. These are schools that really support um, the most underserved communities and have a very, very, very large vulnerable population. So those restaurant crayons ended up becoming art res art resources and we supplemented with art education curriculum that those schools no longer had anyway. So it was a win, 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 win across the board. And since we started it, we collected over 22 million crayons and set a Guinness World Record. And we're in all 50 states, 10 countries. And really it's like anyone can get involved. They just go to the website, download a sign, slap it on a box and start your collection. It's that simple. It doesn't only have to be in restaurants, by the way. At the end of the school year, we have so many kids creating their own crayon collection boxes and more well-served schools. And then in August, it's National Crayon Collection Month so that we could prepare schools for the school year for back to school. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. How long... Uh... How long ago did, that, uh, did you start that organization? How many years ago? So that's been about 10 years old now. And uh, it was when my now 16-year-old daughter was a 
three-year-old and we just kept going to these restaurants and she liked the food there and I was a nervous mom and would just keep taking her to the restaurant because I knew she'd eat and every time it was at home she would just like would refuse to eat and now I look back on it I'm like I had nothing to worry about but that's where Crayon Collection was born. I mean just like you said just observing you know when I when I started actually offer up it was the same thing where I just started to unpack these things that I look at my neighbors and I'd realize they're not parking in their garages. And so I, that led me to dig a little deeper and realize that a quarter of the U.S. population can't park in their garage because they have that much stuff. And then wow. I started realizing like our homes are actually getting bigger, but we're actually having less kids. So my aha was similar to the, 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 the crayon story was just that value was stuck, right? Value was stuck all around us. And I just felt like if we could remove friction, maybe we can unlock some of that value. So, so, so that was the start. And then you've got, yeah, I know there's some other areas that you just, through observation that you said, well, wait, we could do, we could do more here. Yeah, exactly. So after I did the first plastic straw ban, I, I realized if I worked within the city of Malibu, that would be a smaller city that I could kind of get my wish made, which would be a f- the first plastic straw ban in the world versus a larger city like Los Angeles, even though I live you know, in this greater LA city. And that would have been like, I think the first place someone might go to, but I knew like my cousins in Italy or everybody's kind of infatuated with this Malibu vibe. And so if Malibu did it, then the world would hear about it. And actually that's exactly what happened. So the council members were super on board. They were, they're surfers, they're in the water. They know what the problem is. Um, Unanimously voted for this plastic straw band to come out. And then after that, it was a ripple effect. And we kept seeing like city after city, country after country, implement the same thing and even to this day the ordinance that we drafted in the city of Malibu is like the gold standard but after that everyone kept telling me oh my god I'm so frustrated with ordering in every time I order in I get all this plastic cutlery that I never even asked for and so I started to study these food delivery apps and I kept thinking well we can't expect the millions of people who use these apps to put in a note and say well I don't want any more plastic cutlery these restaurants are moving too fast too quick to try to get all these orders done and it's just a very simple thing that I did to create a new change, which was to change the toggle so that users only receive plastic cutlery upon request. And we did that by sending 14,000 emails in to Uber Eats, Postmates, Grubhub, and DoorDash. And one by one, they all participated. And it was through this email platform that we use where we were able to get individuals to participate in this request for change. Since we were able to launch that, it became a state law in the state of California. It became a law in Washington State, New York City. We've saved over a billion packs of plastic cutlery from entering the waste stream. And that's a 600% behavior shift through this toggle being just, again, opt-in versus opt-out. It's saved millions of dollars for restaurants. So it just makes me happy to find solutions that are win-wins like we did with the crayons that you know show people that just being sustainable doesn't always have to be about things that you're sacrificing. You're, you're, we're all benefiting in this regard. You know, yeah. people like to eat with with silverware at home anyway. It's just more desirable and that was a study done by some psychologists that sh- showed that the heavier the utensil is people are happier and the restaurants save money and the planet benefits. So yeah, that was so cut all out yeah, that was kind of I, I, I love I love I love it by having the default just just off. It's such a simple thing, and I think sometimes when you talk to individuals about uh, sustainability, sometimes there's this hesitancy of oh, it's too expensive or it's too much of an inconvenience. And I think this, like you said, this was one, just a no brainer. Uh, and how many times do you get the cheap plastic forks that end up breaking anyhow? Yeah, Maybe it's- <laughs> exactly. And everyone's got that junk drawer. They feel guilty about it. They don't want to throw it away. They don't know what to do with it. So let's just like stop it at the tap. Like let's just stop producing it. And so 40 billion pieces of plastic cutlery are produced per year with the sole intention of being used once and thrown away. So why not shift that number? Yeah. And what do you think about taking it a step further? I'm sure you probably maybe put some thought into this about all of the plates and napkins and everything that it comes in. So up up in Seattle, I I recently did a podcast on a company called uh, um, Taco Time. And Taco Time, 100% of what is in the store is compostable, all of it. And so you can take everything, the sauce comes in, all of it, and you can literally just put it in one bin. And I think for them, their feedback was, was a little bit more expensive on some of the things they were trying to do. But in the end, they had a lot more engagement. People liked the brand more. 
And so have you seen, I mean, I don't know how it is down in California, but have you seen some stores starting to try to go that direction? To be honest, what I'm really excited about is the reusables that are coming into the mix. So they're working really hard to bring this reusable circularity into the food delivery apps and restaurants so that there could be, you know, these containers that you receive and then you return and then they just keep on refilling them and it's just uh, eliminating the waste altogether. So I'm very excited to see that there's some great solutions out there that you'll probably be seeing more of in the next year or so but it's um it's definitely the way of the future to to do the reuse model and i think they're coming up with great systems that actually address all the potential problems with it and we're we're seeing it it's coming yeah they have i don't know if you're familiar with ridwell Uh, there's a company we use in seattle very similar where they will take certain, especially plastics and things that your normal waste management may not take. And then you, you can schedule it from an app and they'll just come take that from you. But what you said, it sounds like a very similar thing. If maybe these food delivery businesses are bringing this to you already, why not just say, hey, we you know, open up the bin and, and now you can you know reuse that. Yeah, reuse it. They wash it. They bring it back to the restaurants. There's there's services that the, the apps would be adopting. It's just fascinating to see how, again, thinking outside the box really is uh, the way to yeah. go here. Yeah, I think a lot about... I think you know, I talk a lot about plastics because I think there's a lot of benefits uh, over the years of of plastics, but also the challenge with them is just the duration it takes for plastic to break down and how negatively it is impacting everything in our, you know, that you see where our oceans or, you know, the foods that we eat. Like the, I think the average U.S. consumer will consume about a credit card worth of plastic every year now uh, because it's in our bottles and all that. And so the more I think we can find alternative ways to do it, or I've always felt like maybe one of the innovations we could have is something, some kind of plastic that just biodegrades over time. Not like the one I use for my compost bin that sometimes it didn't even last a week, like the whole right. bottom's falling out. There's got to be some happy medium there, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing it. It's coming. There's definitely some new technologies. But back to like my, my philosophy is reuse is best you know, all these other alternatives, like there's, there's going to be solutions, I'm sure. But if, if until we get to something that we can absolutely be a hundred percent comfortable with, I think reusables are the way to go. What do you think about, you know, you talk a lot about circularity, which I I think makes a lot of sense going back to, you know, we live in this, this globe, this global supply chain now. It's, uh, but if you look at where value and things are growing is definitely in the urban and like suburban areas where you just have so many more people, like where you live is a perfect example. So I often say a lot of the things that you need are all around you. It's just how do you tap into it is the harder part. And so you're creating with some of the examples you get, you gave, you're tapping into that. Are there other one areas that you start to think, okay, why haven't we figured this out yet? I think online shopping, it's a big problem. I think we're seeing a lot of um, packages coming in these, like a tiny little object and a huge package with all that bubble wrap and all that plastic and it doesn't even need it. So we started a campaign initially called Ship Naked and it was because I received a, um, a handheld vacuum that just had the shipping label on it and it just arrived in the manufacturer's box. And my first comment was it's naked. And so so we created this campaign that we had this naked-ish delivery man bringing a toaster, and it was just... Wait, the del- delivery man was naked? <laughs> yeah, it was our PSA. It's really funny. You got to check it out. Um, but he comes up, and he's just delivering this toaster with, with no packaging again. It really is an interesting thing because we started to create that same online email campaign, and now Amazon offers a toggle that says, ship in manufacturer's packaging. And so the idea is that many times yeah. it's just redundant to put a box that's already ready, tightly packed with all the necessary protections in another box. And then we started to work with UPS and learn that UPS really does want to eliminate as much excess packaging, but it's better for them. Their trucks are loaded up with more packages. There's less drivers needed, less gas is used. So there's so many wins for them again. So that campaign evolved into Ship Greener because there are things that you can pack well, but um, aren't actually able to go naked, quote unquote. So Ship Greener was born and we, we sh- we're seeing tremendous support in that regard from all the sh- all the uh, delivery companies even. Everyone's down for that one. They're like, okay, this makes sense. Let's just try to get people to be a part of it. And they have actually divisions within their companies to help their consumers, which are their co- their clients shipping out to learn how to pack better and, and figure out solutions in that way. So uh, it's great. Like tapping into their services for anyone that's like, for example, a UPS client they can learn these these tricks to make the packages more green and it's it's great to see that they have that well like you said and some of the other examples this seems like a no-brainer win-win-win all across the board it's going to cost 
you know, the manufacturer is less, it's going to cost less to transport, it's going to be better for the environment. And, and the rate, you know, the stat I recall is I think by 2026, we're going to have 260 billion parcels shipped a year. And think about the amount of That's plastic crazy. That isn't all that, right? Like you said, yeah. and that curve is just skyrocketing, especially with the rise of e-commerce, especially over the last decade. Absolutely. And so I think anything we can do to put a bend in that curve, um, you know, is, is super important. I think the one um, campaign that I'm personally most excited about that we started is very similar to the anti-smoking movement that we saw in Hollywood. Uh, we created a campaign called Lights, Camera, Plastic because I was so tired of these type of stats. Like they're so depressing, you know, it's yeah. one stat that I read was there's um, 1 million plastic bottles per minute being thrown away. Now, remember the recycle numbers, some say 9%, some say 6%, some say 3%, but whatever it is, it's under 10%. That's so right. these are all, you know, polluting our environment, our beautiful, precious environment, our oceans. And so I wanted to shift culture. So what I decided to do was, you know, convince some of the biggest Hollywood studios to start swapping out single use plastic or make it mandatory for production to stop showing so much single use plastic and instead show a more um, aspirational lifestyle that is more conscious, which would include reusables, which would even include other behaviors. So walking this to work or school and riding bikes and having reusable bags and things like that so that people start to uh, adopt those habits a little bit more willingly, just like what we saw with, with smoking and seat belts, you know. Um, people change behavior based on what they see and it's proven. So lights, camera, plastic, in my opinion, is one of the most innovative ways to tackle this problem that we are, are facing and, and these type of drastic numbers that are just heart-wrenching truly. So we have to undo whatever we've done because plastic was convenient. Now we need to show that actually reusables are cooler, reusables are better, and it's true, they really are. So let's just start to... Um, create new normal, a new normal that's in society. I love what you said there because I recall, you know, back when smoking was more of a thing. Like how many movies did you watch where people were smoking? All oh, the time. Uh, all of, all, all the, the time. time. I think the plastic one is drives me nuts too. I harp on the the plastic water bottles. That's why I, I often drink on this and like most of my shows uh, because you know, we produce uh, on the planet about 500 billion plastic water bottles a year with a B. And most of those end up in the, if you look at, if you, you know, extract the plastics out of our ocean, 25% of them are the plastic water bottles and the plastic grocery bags. It's a quarter of all. And so I always tell people, they get, you know, kind of frustrated and they feel like they can't make an impact. Just drink out of these and put that you know, that grocery bag, I always say, put it in the car door. Cause I always, I always forget it in the trunk. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But if everyone did that, you would actually make an impact. So there are things that people, I think, just aren't aware of that they can do. But the plastic water ball one is out of control. It really is. And I think part of one of the, the challenges that we even faced was like, we came into the school school system here in uh, LAUSD is, is ours. It's the second largest school district in America. And we got a grant to teach environmentalism to these uh, inner city kids. And they had really never really touched on environmentalism the way that we wanted to teach them. So we walk in and we're like, we're gonna bring reusable water bottles for everybody so we can remove the plastic water bottles from their lives. And the first thing that the administration told me was, uh, and where do you think they're gonna fill their water bottles? And we were like, well, at the water fountains, of course. Well, sure enough, the water fountains were so dilapidated, so disgusting, there was absolutely no way they could get their water bottles filled. So we brought in Assemblymember Bloom's uh, team field worker to talk to the kids for one of the weeks. We brought in a whole bunch of different speakers each week, and it was really about environmental justice at this point. So we tried everything to replace the water bottles and the water filtration stations, but we were hit with this massive bill that we couldn't even afford to, to help them, you know, change out the water fountains. Well, cut to 2022 and Assembly Member Bloom spearheads this bill in the state of California that made every single school in California change out their, um, if they even change a tile, if it's a new build, if there's anything going on, they must provide a, a water filtration station for every 350 students. Then LAUSD added a $33 million investment to make sure that all their water was also super clean because 
thought was the other issue is that the water wasn't even clean here in, in LAUSD. So sometimes wow. there's an infrastructure issue and then we have to tackle that in order to make it an option to drink out of a reusable. So sometimes it's like there is no option, but many times yeah. if you fix those problems, then the expectation of going reusable can be had. Well, I, I love that example too, because as you're talking, it makes me think of visiting even some of my, my kids' schools here in, in Washington. And, and, the, and the water fountain looks like it's the original one from like the 70s. Right. And, it's and you can't really drink out of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think if you fix that and back to the point of, you know, why aren't we teaching our youth? You know, why aren't we spending some time during the day to talk about the planet a little bit more and the things they can do? Because I, th- I find the younger generation really cares about this far more, not just saying it by acting. I think you see a lot more of them willing to buy secondhand goods. And it's just, it just doesn't have this mystique that, yeah. it, oh, it's, you know, secondhand or, uh, I just, uh, they're living a much simpler life, I think. And so they care about these things. But I also feel like the younger generation is kind of screaming for answers, right? Because this yeah. is a complex topic. And that's part of the reason I'm spending time on interesting conversations like this uh, to hopefully for the people watching to just saying, oh, there are a few things I can do. And right. so I think that's what it takes. That's why I, I love these different movements you're doing because that's what it takes. You need, you need to name it, identify the problem and start to take actions towards it. Are you branding these things, by the way? I love, I love the names of all these things that you're coming up with. <laughs> I always have this, like I started after college, I went into marketing and advertising. So all these catchy names just come naturally to me. I think the, the biggest thing I'm doing right now is my book is coming out and that's called The Imperfect Environmentalist. And I think that that name really gives people comfort and they're like I want to know more about that I can do that that's something that I can feel welcome to be a part of that movement so we're working on that and on Earth Day 2024 the book hits bookshelves and we'll see how that goes but I, I do think like coming up with these names that make people wonder, lean in a little bit and be like, what is she talking about? Like ship naked? What in the world is that? And so when you kind of come into it and you see a naked delivery man, it it is kind of funny and it makes you just like look. And that's what we want is for people to just look and listen and not feel that there's this like huge barrier between where they are and where they could be. Because it's really about just those small tweaks. And then you're like, hey, I did that. And maybe I could do one more thing. And maybe there's, you know, a couple other things. You don't have to be perfect is what we say. Yeah, I I like to be fairly transparent with people. I am not living off the grid and, you know, I don't have uh, I don't have a cow in my backyard to get milk from. Like, like I don't I am not uh, I, I think I'm environmentally conscious, but I'm not a super extremist at all. But part of it, I would say on this my own journey I've been on is kind of like you said, just as you start to get enlightened and understand certain things, you say just no more like the discipline for this for me yeah. to carry this around. It's we treat our water bottles or our house just like putting shoes on now. When we leave the house, it's like where's everyone's water bottle? And if you don't have it, and you know we're out, let's say at a place that, that you know they're like, oh, you can you can get water here in a plastic water bottle. I tell my kids no. Like I've, right. I've seen my son, oh, this food's spicy. I don't care. Like we, we're that we've gotten that hardcore about it now. Yeah. But it's taken a while to kind of, I think, get in that that habit. That's great. I mean, I got to say, I, I feel for your son on that day that he was having spicy <laughs> food, but he'll remember. Well, now he brings it. Like, now yeah. he brings it, exactly. Well, what uh, are there other things? I'm kind of curious. You have this, this theme of things that you see and you, you focus on. You know, I always think there's food. There's there's so many different areas from transportation, things you could dig into that are interesting. Or is it for you more, hey, these things are circular. I think there's an easy habit that can be formed here. I'm just going to spend time. I'm just kind of curious how you formulate these different initiatives you want right. to get after. Um, the thing is, like things keep popping up, I would say. And when they, they keep popping up and it's like, hey, this just keeps happening. Like, for example, one of our campaigns is called Eight Meals. And it came it came into my mind that, you know, the Amazon rainforest was on fire. And I was like, how is this happening? And someone posted something that it's like our hamburgers are causing these fires. And I thought, what in the world is the connection here? And I, I started to research and it, it occurred to me that really, like, it's not just the actual cattle farming that's the problem, but it's raising the food to feed the cattle that's causing a lot of the deforestation and like the precious Amazon is being affected um, and and burned down on purpose and I'm like this is completely crazy really like what could be more crazy than this and so I started to research and it said you know on multiple places you know, eating a plant-based diet is one of the most important things individuals could do. Coming from a Persian background, this was never an option for us. Like eating a Persian, I mean, eating Persian food is always family style. And my mom used to say, just eat around the meat. And it reminded me of my big fat Greek wedding when the guy says, I'm a vegetarian. And he says, well, it's okay, you can have the lamb. So I realized very quickly that 
um, being partially plant-based might be a solution for people because 97% of the population is not plant-based, is not vegan. Only 3% is. So I found this study by the University of Michigan talking about how if we were all in Western cultures able to reduce our animal protein intake by 40%, we actually create enough carbon offset to combat climate change. And I thought, this is really fascinating. So I dug in further and further and I met with the researchers and they basically said, yes, this is, and here's the calculation, which is actually all on our website. And I decided that I wanted to create a campaign that people could kind of wrap their head around rather than this very, very dense study. And I thought, okay, well, if the average individual eats 21 meals per week, what's 40% of that? And it's approximately eight meals. So if we could commit to eating eight plant-based meals, that's a very, very big jump from not having any consciousness around it to doing something that actually makes an impact. And then people kept asking us like, well, where do I go? How do I start? And I kept thinking, well, just eat eight plant-based meals. How does that you know, feel to you? They're yeah. like, yeah, but where do I go? And so we decided to help people through it a little further. And we created an app that's free called Habits of Waste. And people can track their meals, plug them into their calendar, find recipes, um, see their carbon offset. And just continue to do that. And we've worked with some great, huge companies that have actually challenged their client, their not clients, their employees to do it too. And it meets their ESG goals. So it became this like fun challenge that was gamified for people to participate in this. And you can put stickers on pictures of your food and post it and just make it really fun. So anyway, um, that's one of my favorite campaigns we have because people have done the eight meals and then gone to 12 meals and 15 meals. And some have even, one guy was a butcher's son with all sorts of medical issues. And he came and gave us a testimonial. He went fully vegan and is off all his medications. Now that's a pretty extreme case, but we're seeing that like giving people an entry point that's accessible is really all it takes for them to give it a go. But when you say go fully vegan, it's like, whoa, 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 that's, that's a lot. So That's, that's terrifying. Well, I, th- I think two things you said uh, I was going to double click on. the. I think we're at a point now on the planet where there's more land on the planet to feed humans than there are for wildlife now. That's a, a oh stat gosh. that I heard. I think we passed that recently, which was kind of scary to think about. Uh, and so that's how you connect it. That's like to the Amazon again. But yeah. I didn't know any of this as I went on to it. I always just felt like, oh, there's so much, you know, especially being in Seattle and flying around like all this land out here. Well, it's just crazy to think that we have so much of it. It's now just just basically our, our food supply chain. That's right. And then the other one, I think, is back to kind of health issues that we all have. Like it just so sensitive to certain foods. Like I can't eat a lot of red meat at all. I eat very little red meat. But sometimes if I go out and eat like a steak, then I'm always just not feel I'm not feeling good. Right. Um, so I always I have a hard t- I have a hard time trying to figure out what I should and shouldn't be eating. But I do know that when I do less meat, I feel better. Well, the good news is that this is a time in 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 you know in our history where there's more options to be fully plant based easier than ever before. So that's positive. I personally uh, prefer to eat whole foods plant-based and we only promote those on our on our app because we want it to be cost effective and, and accessible to everybody. So you could feed like a family of four with some of the recipes that we have on, on our site for less than $10 because it's chickpeas, which is like a dollar for can, per can and yeah. you know, just a few other th- rice, a few other things. And it doesn't, it doesn't make it impossible. And I think some of the myths are that to eat a plant-based diet, you have to have a lot of money or you have to be, you know, in LA and one of these, you know, kind of (laughs) green communities like Venice or something. It's not true. So we're trying to dispel all of those and again, make it accessible to people and be like, Hey, just take a look, see how it feels for you. And most of the time, like you said, when they start eating the plant-based meals, they feel better and they're like, "Hmm, what's different here? And you know, your, your meal budgets are less. It's just a win, win, win. Once again, I think food is just, you know, again, back to the, this whole wave we've been on. It's like, oh, faster, more convenient, faster, more convenient. And that the negative effects of that, you know, you can just feel it in our bodies. And yeah. I think, you know, the, clearly the best thing would be to have your own farm and, you know, you know, but no one's, that's not practical for anyone anymore. Yeah. And, you know, to be honest with you, I also feel that sometimes we're lacking the connection to nature to really want to do these things. So some of the things that we promote is like on Sundays, go outside, you know, have a picnic, spend as much time as you can outdoors, because once you feel that connection, it's a lot easier to participate in any of these things. Like even me, myself, like I used to grow up, I grew up in New Jersey on a pretty much like the most natural 
land. I lived in a in a little uh, small town that had a creek running through the whole town, and and it ran through the side of my house. That's where I was my entire childhood. Then we moved to to Southern California, and I was like in the grid of you know all the houses, all the streets, just like gridlocked essentially. And I fell out of touch with nature and I felt that there was something missing, but I didn't know what it was. And when I ended up moving where I live now, which is by the beach and looking out the window every day and seeing this pristine ocean, I am reminded constantly of my role I need to play to protect the planet. And it's really because of the access I have. And so I'm not saying that everybody has access to these beautiful natural environments, but just being outside as much as possible lends itself to providing you the fuel necessary, if you will, to take action. Yeah. I had the same thing. I grew up with a a similar childhood. We lived on uh, five acres in the woods and we had a little stream and ponds and a creek by the house. And I just, that's what I did as a kid. I mean, this is pre, you know, early stage video games and smartphones. So, you know, you spend a lot of time roaming around the woods uh, and that stuck with me. And and then most recently I did a trip down the Yukon river and rafts uh, with some friends. We did 130 miles with a guy. It was very savage by the way. So it wasn't, I wouldn't take (laughs) all my friends, only a few friends I could do, do that with. Uh, But the guide that we were with, like I'm not a hunter at all, but we ate like Kings. Uh, We, he, 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 out of the last year, he spent 300 days in the wild. And so the things I learned just from hearing his stories and stuff, he said he's lived in the last, for seven years he's not once bought meat wow. it's just through bartering or you know get a moose that's 900 pounds of meat so we were eating fresh moose caribou and that whole week i was actually really surprised at how well my gut felt because oh, i'm eating like purely organic you know wild game again not really practical in the day and age but you, it just makes you think more about what is into what are we feeding these animals you know what is in what is going into these meats who knows uh, but i think that that stuck with me a little bit. Well, I know we're kind of over, almost you know, pretty much over on time, but um, me, one other question I'd have for you is you think about, I always like to think about the crystal ball, you know, you know, you have so many different things you're, you're pushing along and, you know, it's hard in the beginning, like your whole crayon effort took a decade. Like they always do. Big things are hard in the, in the beginning, then they get kind of momentum. You know, if you, th- if you think about even the next 10 years, you know, what are you hoping evolves in the world uh, either from something you're driving or do you feel like we're at maybe even at a, a, a stage as a society where maybe it's a tipping point where people are just way more aware of these things and seeking answers. And so yeah. curious I on think, your thoughts. Yeah, I think right now um, I hear a lot about climate anxiety and people are facing that on, of like on a real level and they're they're truly afraid and they're truly feeling the, the pressure of what we're facing here. Um, and I hope that some of the things that we're doing here at Habits of Waste and with, you know, the imperfect environmentalist movement that we're building will alleviate some of that climate anxiety and translate that fear into action and and show people that actually you don't need to be considered a full vegan or a full environmentalist to take action. Like if you are living on this planet and you are breathing, you can be an imperfect environmentalist and participate on all these levels. And if we can inspire the masses, I'm talking about, you know, billions of people to just do a little bit, that adds up in a tremendous way very quickly as you know and we have some some solutions some real answers so i think we also don't expect that it's the individual's problem to solve this this climate issue but that we also have tools to have them communicate to legislators communicate to corporations on a much higher level and squeeze the top down bottom up approach but we also have to have skin in the game. So we have to participate while putting pressure at the top and give them, again, an outlet to use that climate anxiety for something good. So that's my big wish. Um, And of course, in order to do this on a mass scale, we need funding. And so we, you know, we're always looking for donations so that people can say, I'm going to give $10 to this cause because I know that they have a strategy that will get us where we need to be. And so, you know, we ask every time I do an interview, I'm always asking people visit Habits of Waste org make a donation if you can it really does go to a very very specific sol- problem solving strategy for climate change that's super wonderful thank you so much for being here today really appreciate the time and the, and the conversation thank you nick